So what happens during a gaining phase? Now we're into our gaining phases. So our energy intake is going to increase, but the size of the surplus is going to decrease over time due to adaptive thermogenesis. And this is what Martin spoke about um, to great extent during his previous presentation. So at the start, we're going to have low to moderate body fat, regular appetite, high motivation, low re recovery capacity because we've got less body fat, and less energy in general, low and neat. And at the end of our massing phase, when we're all massed up, we're eating all the food, we're going to have higher body fat percentage, reduced appetite, low motivation to eat, higher recovery capacity because we've got so much food coming in, higher and eat, and that's it. So that's going to happen during a gaining phase, and that's going to make it harder to continue to gain, especially because we're going to have reduced appetite. So adjusting the diet during a gaining phase. So physiological stalls occur when the client is not in an energy imbalance. So therefore, we need to increase calorie intake, decrease TDEE, or both to create a calorie surplus. We're going to have to continue to take measurements, so taking scale weight faster at the same time each day. And we need to track this over averages of weeks and months because gaining body weight is going to be slightly, we want our surplus to be, our rate of gain to be slightly slower than our rate of loss. It is a lot harder to build muscle tissue than it is to lose body fat. The analogy which Lyndon often uses is trying to build muscle mass is like trying to construct a skyscraper. It's incredibly technical and very difficult and very time consuming. Whereas losing body fat is like, knocking a skyscraper down. It's like, it's not that hard. You can do it very quickly and it's still dangerous, but it, it can happen a lot faster than putting a skyscraper up. We still need progress photos. So faster, same time and, same time and um, position. And we need to assess changes every week, fortnight, month. So remember, resistance training is the most potent stimulus for muscle growth. Diet augments the muscle protein synthetic response to resistance training. And if a calorie surplus was the primary driver of muscle growth, we would have a hypertrophy epidemic rather than an obesity epidemic. So even they, though today's presentations are all nutrition-based, we still need to remember that if our goal is to gain as much muscle mass as possible, our training regime is going to be the primary focus because it's going to have the most potent effect on muscle synthetic response. So why body weight gain stalls? So this is just going to be the opposite to our why body weight stalls during a dieting phase. So we're going to have over time, we're going to have our body temperature is going to increase, spontaneous energy is going to increase, calories expended through digestion is going to increase because we're going to be eating more food and calories expended through training is going to increase because our body's just got so much energy, it's just trying to use it where it can. We're going to have a reduced appetite and increased satiation. So you're simply going to be less hungry on a day-to-day -day basis. And you're going to have low adherence during the cognitive disinhibitions. So it's funny because we can have low adherence to both extremes when we're gaining and when we're losing weight. So if we're losing weight, we're going to have low adherence because our body's going to be like, oh, I need to eat. And you're going to overeat. But if we're in a gaining phase, you're simply going to be like, oh, I'm going to skip a meal here. I'm not going to finish this meal. I'm not going to eat as much because your body's just going to be sick of food from continually trying to drive body weight up and up. So looking at rates of gain. So muscle gain occurs at a much slower rate than fat loss due to the muscle synthetic response to resistance training being much smaller than lipolytic effects of dieting. Training performance combined with scale weight and visuals are the best means of determining improvements in muscularity. Because, of course, you want to be gaining muscle tissue, not necessarily just gaining fat tissue. And as Martin was talking about in his presentation, the fat cells are going to be very responsive to overfeeding relative to muscle cells. When we're looking at rates of gain, beginners can gain at 1% to 1.5% of body weight per month. Intermediates can gain at 0.5 to 1% of body weight per month, so slightly slower rates of gain. And then advanced individuals, 0.25 to 0.5% of body weight per month. So this is going to be an even slower rate of gain because they've eked out the majority of their muscular adaptations and they can only gain muscle at a slightly slower rate. So is the client gaining at the appropriate rate? We want to make sure that our clients are gaining at the appropriate rate depending on how developed and how developed they are and their level of maturation. We want to ensure their performance is improving because remember the, the resistance training itself is going to be the primary driver of muscle gain. So if their body weight is just going up and up and up, but their performance isn't doing anything in the gym, 
it's like, well, realistically, if it's not aggressive and it's not overloading, how much muscle tissue are we actually accruing? And are their visuals improving? So one thing which I like to see when my clients are in a gaining phase are their visuals either improving or even staying static. So like you might have somebody and that you put two photos side by side and it's like, oh, they look like maybe they've gained one kilo or two kilos in those two photos and they've actually gained 10 or 15. And that's an awesome indicator that they've gained a large amount of muscle tissue because it looks like their body fat percentage is still relatively similar. So here's an example on the right here. So I was four kilos heavier after six months of gaining, but I actually look a little bit leaner. So some of this is uh, can be attributed to the fact that I was coming off an injury, but still it's like the fact that I don't look like six to 10 kilos heavier, um, just if you take away the, the, the weight down the bottom is indicative that I probably gained a, a large amount of contractile tissue relative to, my, uh, relative to fat tissue. So diet adjustments for weight gain. So when, so we want our diet, uh, our, we want to change our nutrition protocol if all metrics for 14 to 21 days in a gaining phase. And how much do we want to improve it? So depend on the current intake, adherence and timeframes and from what sources. So carbohydrates, we've got no upper limit outside of adherence and practicality issues when it comes to carbohydrates. So Martin was talking about, he said like seven grams per kilogram is a pretty good um, amount for someone, especially if they're like a gen pop. Um, we probably don't usually see too much more than that unless they're a bit of a freak, but you could definitely get instances where there are athletes who are on ridiculous amounts of carbohydrates per day, um, especially more so in like long-term endurance sports. There are, there are reports of like Tour de France cyclists who probably weigh 65, 70 kilos soaking wet, having 1500 calories a day during competition. It's 1500 grams of carbs, sorry, 1500 grams of carbs a day during a competition, simply because like carbohydrates are beneficial for training, performance, recovery, and there's no upper limit. So you can just keep cranking them higher. So fat, our maximum is going to be 0.5 grams of per body weight per day. So we're going to have a bit of a cap on our fat intake simply because fats are going to be more conducive to storing body fat because if a fat molecule is sitting there in the bloodstream, our body can go, okay, I'm going to take this fat molecule and I'm going to stick it straight into an adipocyte cell and it doesn't actually have to alter the chemical composition of that molecule too much. You can just go store it. Whereas carbohydrates are going to be a lot harder to store as body fat because they have to go through like a chemical like destruction and then anabolism and turn it into a fat cell before they store it. So when in a gaining phase, we tend to go higher carb, lower fat, because not only are carbs more beneficial for training, but they're harder to actually store as body fat. And protein usually maxes out about three grams per kilogram. The reason why we don't necessarily ramp up protein compared to carbohydrates is because protein is going to be more satiating and there's going to be a, a lot more diminishing returns in regards to the benefits scaled with protein consumption. Again, this one is just for you guys to view at your leisure. And then we're going to go into manipulating food pleasure reward. So our appetite is going to be reduced during a gaining phase and food becomes less pleasurable and less de desirable. So therefore, we need to increase food palatability. We need to make food taste better so that we actually like, oh, sweet, like I'm going to eat it. I can't think of anything more miserable than being in a gaining phase and having to eat chicken breast and broccoli out of a Tupperware container. Like that, just, if you're doing that at, at the top end of a bulk, your life is going to just be miserable. You're going to have to increase food palatability, food palatability at, some, at some stage and make food taste better so that you're going to be able to eat it to up, uphold your adherence. Potentially decrease protein intake because protein is going to be uh, increasingly saturated, uh, sorry, increase your satiety. So provided we've got, let's say, two grams per kilogram of protein during a gaining phase, we probably don't necessarily need to push that up and up and up. Probably don't have to go above three grams per kilogram. That's definitely the upper end. And instead, we can look to increase maybe fat or carbohydrates or more palatable sources of food. Eating at scheduled intervals definitely helps. Decreasing food volume and increasing energy density. Decreasing fiber intake and decreasing caffeine intake and eating a little bit faster. So trying to, if you've got a big meal in front of you, try to eat as much of that meal quicker so that 
before your body starts kicking in and starts getting sick of the food. Um, one thing which I try to do when I'm in fanning phase is if I sit down and I cook a big meal, by the time I sit down to eat the meal, I'm usually full simply from cooking the meal because I was exposed to the different smells of the food. So you might actually really separate the cooking and the eating like when you're in a masked out phase so that you're not, your appetite's not literally being um, dulled just by smelling food. So mini cut strategies. So mini cuts we can incorporate during a gaining phase to make sure the gaining phase doesn't get out of hand. So a mini cut is a short and aggressive dieting phase used during an extended gaining phase to minimize excessive fat gain. So when body fat accumulation exceeds a point where it's beneficial for training performance, when hunger is low and adherence is compromised, when some a client just simply cannot get any more food in, when competitive season nears or weight class requirement must be met, and the duration is approximately three to six weeks, any more than three to six weeks, and it kind of just turns into a regulation fat loss phase. And we're looking for a relatively fast rate of loss. So one to 2% of body weight per week, because the aim is to lose a, fast, a large amount of body fat in a short amount of time so that we can then continue on with another gaining phase. So if we had a 24 week gaining phase, we might incorporate a mini cut around week 16 for maybe two to three weeks. And then we can just continue on gaining as normal.